So we're going to get our next panel up. The next panel is about developing resources, sharing learning and challenges. So if we can have Claire and Hilda and Christina on stage, that would be great. So we're going to start off by everyone introducing themselves and talking a little bit about what you do. Okay, so who needs to be at the table? Basically, everyone needs to be at the table, including the gambling industry, but you have to have people who've got experience of their lives being impacted by gambling harms. So these are some examples of jigsaw lids. You can download that and it'll also be emailed round to you. It's a tool that we created, we've adapted for different circumstances and it's a way of seeing the world through different points of view. So we had a wee brief conversation earlier about whether or not we should have gambling advertising. The jigsaw lids are a way to gather diverse points of view then bring them together, as have happened there, and you can look at them and see where do we share areas in common, and then let's work on that. So things we don't agree on, we can park. Things we do agree on, let's work on that. Um, these will be circulated round. Coming from that, evolved this idea of gambling harms champions, and this came from people with lived experience about what they felt the wider community could do to actually be a champion for gambling harms, to raise awareness about the challenges, to signpost people to support and to take action. So one of the things I'm putting a plug out there for, because I keep hearing it from people that I'm connected to, is to bring down the shutters on scratch cards. Um, because scratch cards are an absolute bane on people's lives. You know, they go into the shop and they're there. You know, promises of all sorts of futures. We put tobacco behind shutters. It's about time we put scratch cards there too. And that is just saying how networks will support. Um, we need to network, we need to share information to make a difference because none of us can do it alone. Now, Hilda Davis from Cope Scotland, we are not gambling harms experts, charities, but a charity that want to work with others to help people suffer less, and gambling makes people suffer. So, Christina, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Christina Deneen, and you've likely seen me dashing around uh, throughout the event. Um, I'm the project development officer in the Hub, and I've been on the team for, for a fair few years now. Um, over the course of a, a range of changes, but most recently I've been working on the Gambling Education Toolkit um, this year's edition, which came out, I don't know, about a month ago. And there's just an example of another kind of resource that we've, we've worked on. That one's kind of a more bite-sized one that's a leaflet. Um, but then also today we launched our new website. So um, I have experience of developing a range of resources, and I'm looking forward to discussing what that looks like with my fellow panelists. Claire, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us who you are. Sure. Um, hi, so I'm uh, Claire Wiley. Um, I am really excited and interested to be here today because I come from, uh, just personally, quite a different background. So my background is in research. My main kind of research interest is in uh, lived experience, research based on lived experience and using that to bring about change either in services or in policy but um, from a kind of health and research background rather than education and young people and so it's very exciting to be here and see um, yeah just uh, how ahead the sector is um, in terms of um, yeah involvement with people and doing things that are really engaging and, and based in communities so yeah. Um, so um, I've been working in gambling harms for some time now and um, this is a project that we have just launched the first phase of. Um, uh, so working in an initiative called Tackling Gambling Stigma and I want, I'm going to show you just a little bit of what the resource is and then explain why it is that we're doing the project and, and, and the reasoning behind the resource. So please do go to the website. Um, it's a, a site basically that's built off um, interviews of people with the experience of gambling harms. Um, oh, sorry. 
Um, so what we did is we've, we've interviewed a range of people. I think we're at about 50 now, but there's slightly fewer on the website. Um, and we organized the experiences into themes. Um, so we've got gambling experiences, gambling companies, stigma, harm, recovery, and change, what people want to see change. And what we've tried to do is very much just uh, use people's voices and what they said, and just use research to kind of organize that and look across what people said to bring them into the kind of themes that then become accessible and engage with. But most of the website is quotes from people, either in video or in text or um, in audio. Um, and you can go move around the website and read and see um, what people's experiences of gambling harm have been in all these different areas. So it's a way to really get to grips with understanding what is that lived experience, what is the experience of developing addiction, how does that work, how does that go through um, different phases, what does the industry do? What role does industry play in, the, in creating that addiction? Um, experiences of stigma, um, harm, and also what, pe what, what do people want to see different? What, what change do they want to see? Um, also recovery, what helps people to recover, and what messages they have through some of um, <laughs> So you'll see that it's also very important that um, people are on the website in their own right. Um, so we've also got a page where you can go and click on each of the different contributors and you can get a little bit of information about them. Um, and then all the different times they all, some of the key quotes from them. So you can get a sense of the person um, as well. Uh, so that's, that's the resource at the moment. So at the moment we've finished the kind of first phase, which really was, um, I'll talk a bit in a minute, but this, this focuses on people who've experienced gambling harm themselves uh, through, through their own gambling. Um, we're in the process now of building um, a section of the site that looks at the experiences of affected others, so that it really starts to show the impacts of kind of harm and, and gambling in a kind of 360 degrees. So you can move between gamblers' own experiences and the experiences of, of those around them. Um, and we're aiming to do that, uh, to have that up in spring. Um, and then just very quickly, the, the kind of thinking or the rationale behind it. So fundamentally, um, we know there's huge stigma around gambling harm, but importantly, that stigma also contributes to dis discrimination in the way that gambling is, is dealt with in public policy. Uh, the key way to, to tackle stigma is through social contact. But by using media, we can bring the experiences of people to a much bigger audience. Um, also using research tools so that we are uh, kind of systematically gathering um, information and organizing that in a way, making sense of it alongside people with lived experience. And then I think the other key thing is trying to make sure that we're bringing the issue to attention and intervening at multiple levels. So I think a lot of the stigma of work in gambling sometimes ends up with this kind of Oh, people are stigmatized, therefore they don't seek help. We want them to seek help, they should seek help. And it all just becomes, yet again, the onus put on individuals to do something, um, as opposed to changing the conditions around the person as well. Uh, so make, trying to make sure that our sources and our messages and the, the kind of impact of lived experience is seen and makes change not only the level of the individual, but also wider public policy and um, Services. Thanks very much. So, um, to start with, Hilda, a question for you. Uh, it is increasingly recognised that the range of voices need to be heard and involved through resource development. Oh, Whether or not it's a form of co production or through consultation, including experts by experience, the people we support, and other, any other key stakeholders. Who needs to be at the table and what do these conversations look like? How do we negotiate disagreement? How do we factor the time and resources involved in planning? Oh, that's an easy question, isn't it? <laughs> okay, you I showed you the jigsaw it. lids. So the jigsaw lids is one tool and that will be circulated. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it, but just imagine we all have a jigsaw in front of us. When we're talking about what to do to address gambling harms, we may imagine the vision and the image on that jigsaw lid is the same. It could be completely different. 
So by using Jigsaw lives with diverse stakeholders, that's people who've experienced, family members who've experienced or someone they care about, and the gambling industry, we've never done it with, but I would love to have a Jigsaw lid. For the gambling industry, because it's understanding what do they think needs to happen to reduce gambling harms. And then once you've done all that, you have a variety of lids. So rather than trying to imagine how someone else sees the world, you've got 12 pieces. And we keep it to 12. Too few, you're not on, on all the contributions. Too many, and it becomes unmanageable. To then say, is there anything that we've got in common? And usually there's at least one thing. And it's like, right, okay, let's work on that one thing. But it has to be led by people who know what can go wrong. So the analogy I often use is, if you're going to design a chair for someone who's a keen reader, now, somebody who's a really keen reader may have no skills whatsoever for designing a chair. They may think they've got a good idea, they sit in the chair, chair collapses, but they know what a good chair for reading in will be like. You can get somebody else who's really good at building chairs, but never reads. But they've been given a contract. Hey, build a perfect reading chair. So they do. And everyone that reads it goes, Phew, I'm not going to use that. And that's the reason why the most important voices at the table have to be the people who are actually going to use whatever the service is going to be, who are going to experience whatever the change in society is going to be. So thinking about young people, it's saying to young people, what do you need to hear that will help you recognise that there is risk and then be as creative as possible about how we share that? But yeah, it's a big question, but talking to each other is a start. Um, I think that's a really interesting response because it's, it's something we've struggled with a lot. I think, obviously, fast forward, specifically focus around children and young people and increasingly families. Um, so we want to be hearing from children and young people and families about, um, about what they need, and we want them to be involved in the process of designing anything. The big challenge that we've, we've often come up against is that we can involve children and young people, and we can involve lived experience, but there's not a lot of overlap. Um, so there are not a lot of children and young people um, represented in lived experience groups, for example. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, it's, it's not kind of an accident, and there are lots of kinds of logistical and child protection reasons that go into that. So it's not necessarily something that's going to be solved overnight. But um, I, I suppose that's just to raise a challenge um, around kind of the co-production spaces that when we're thinking about designing resources or even our trainings, um, those are maybe the young people we've got in mind. We've, we've also got young people who could potentially be affected others or go on to gamble later in life. But um, it can be tricky, so so you work with the people who are the closest um, that you can possibly get to to the groups that you're thinking of. Um, but just to float a challenge out there in case anybody has any brilliant thoughts, um, we'd, we'd love to hear them. Um, I think I just want to pick up on two points, both of that have already been uh, kind of raised. The one is. That, um, the important role of having kind of professional skills alongside and supporting people with lived experience and as a way in which to make sense of and use that lived experience. So absolutely, lived experience is absolutely the core thing. The people who have experienced the issue are the people who know about it. Um, but actually, as you said, there is a role to bring alongside knowledge of people who build chair or knowledge of people who do research or knowledge of people who do, you know, from people who do education. And having those two things, I think, in dynamic interaction and in real partnership is where you get some really good stuff happening rather than kind of putting all the burden on you know, people with lived experience. They need to come up with these answers and, uh, yeah, to give something about processes, safe processes, bringing together different skill sets and perspectives. Um, and then just the thing about, yeah, I think um, you, will, you may have noticed on site as it currently is, what is largely represented there is um, sort of white British males. Now, there was a huge spread of those, actually. So it's a very diverse group that we spoke to, and it's a very important group. 
Um, so very diverse in terms of socioeconomic background, types of gambling, the length they've been gambling, when they stopped gambling, age. Um, yeah, really, really diverse. And that group is very important. It's a group that experiences a huge amount of stigma and it's often tied in with kind of masculinity and issues of admitting not being in control and the gambling industry absolutely plays into that. It's kind of, it's marketing around masculinity, et cetera, et cetera. But the project kind of worked because there is an existing, very active lived experience community that does, at the moment, tend to be largely male, because that is the kind of group that's historically gambled more, um, historically been more effective, and there's been kind of space that's opened up for that group to speak and speak publicly. Now, the project, as the way we conceived it, really didn't actually work to get the voices of women or more diverse groups. So although lots of women told us their story off the record, and even though they could be anonymous on the site, um, they didn't want to actually commit themselves to an interview. Um, so that tells us that actually there's something about the process and the way it's working that it's kind of, it's worked because we've got good connections with this existing live community and they are happy to be public and it's worked for them. But the next phase is we want to do some much more to kind of work with community groups on women, different diverse communities and adapt the project so that it works for them because it clearly in its current form hasn't. Um, yeah, so as you're saying, yeah, kind of who's lived experience and how you get to lived experience. None of those things are kind of natural and obvious always. Okay, so next question. Depending on the medium used, visuals can often be a helpful way to make resources more engaging and accept, uh, accessible. However, it can be challenging to make sure the visuals look relevant yet convey the right tone and don't act as triggers, as well as portraying gambling and related behaviours in an all too positive light, or too negative for that matter. So how have you balanced some of these considerations in the pieces of work that you've developed? Do you want to start with, you know? Um, so this is something that we, we are always trying to learn. Um, and I don't think we've struck a perfect balance. Um, but And we're also, I think, constantly changing in what we would consider um, to be okay um, imagery to be using and what might be actually too close or too triggering. I think one big consideration for us is the context in which um, it's going to be shown or kind of who's going, who we're picturing um, as the audience because imagery that might be shown in um, say a group of young people who are either particularly high risk or who maybe have already been identified as some of them are experiencing some gambling harms um, needs to be a lot more carefully considered and um, and as comfortable as, as we can make it um, so that people can still engage with the topic without needing to um, disengage completely. One thing that we've been trying, um, I don't know if this is the, the perfect answer, but one thing that we've been trying to do um, when we're th thinking of, um, say, like videos where we want it to be hard hitting, but not um, t taking it so far that it's upsetting or triggering for anyone is um, suggestive visuals so that we're not showing um, people engaging in gambling, but we're showing say people on their phones or showing kind of flashing lights and kind of mimicking things. Um, so, that, so that's kind of one direction that we've been going down, particularly because the concern is that if, if you're constantly developing gambling education resources, you'd, be, you'd end up showing a lot of um, what could be seen as almost, it's, it's like almost advertising if you're showing kind of cards and dice and, and all this kind of visuals all over the place all the time. You don't want to be pushing people towards that. But then also you want it to be clear what you're actually speaking about. So it's it's a really delicate balance. Um, and we, we keep trying to, to strike it as best we can. Whoever wants to go in Would you? Yeah, it's a difficult one because triggering seems to be something that we talk about more and more and more and more and more. And yet the world is not a safe place. Um, we would love to be able to legislate that whenever somebody opened their mouth they were kind. <laughs> we would love that every film that was made 
promoted kindness to self, each other and the planet, but it's not like that. So there is a balance to be struck around how we learn to look after ourselves by recognising this is distressing for me. And I'm going to talk to somebody about that and knowing who it is that we're going to talk to. Rather than I'm going to avoid it because by actually avoiding it could in the long term create an even bigger challenge. Whereas if we're op more open and we say that's upset me and I need to talk about that's upset me. So there's this balancing act between making sure you don't overtly do something that's going to cause distress while recognising even what I'm saying just now, there may be some people in this room are taking offence at what I'm saying. I'm coming from a place of kindness. I don't mean to be offensive, but some people may, th may be offended by that. And that's a challenge when you're de developing new materials. Um, the one last spin, the, the film which people had seen, there's a, a singer, Amanda Leham, um, created a song to go along with that. And we thought, would you, speaking to Martin and Adrian and Amanda, would you like us to put together a music video for it? We did it in-house, um, using images um, that people have shared with us um, that resonated um, with their experience. And it doesn't miss and hit the wall. Now, we've got a disclaimer before you watch it to say that this film does touch on things. But I think it resonates with the earlier conversations about stories where people want to see grieving families at a gravesite because they've lost somebody to suicide as a result of their gambling, where a, a family are breaking their heart because one of the adults has been taken out by the police and is going to get locked up um, for a year. So there's something about how do we hold up, because it is like a war, how do we hold up the ugliness of what gambling can do while sanitising it so that no one's offended by the image that they're holding up. If anyone's got an answer to that, love to hear it. And if I've offended anyone, my apologies, it's something I struggle with every day, is how do we get the balance between the world the way it is and having that conversation and not offending people by talking about the world the way it is? Yes, yeah, so, um, yeah, just agree with what's been said. I think, um, just to say, what, in, the, in the field of, of, of sort of uh, gambling harm, um, and remember that I'm, I'm working very much in a kind of adult space, not a young person space, I think there's also, leaving aside images, there's lots of debate around language. So some things are very clear, like gambling, but then what? Replacing it with, and what do those, and when by re just replacing the word problem with harmful or problematic, or have you actually changed the meaning of what you're saying? Um, so I think it's a two things, which is so at the moment we're looking at, for example, um, materials that are used in training, and like they've taken out the word problem gambler, but the overall framework and the overall messages aren't necessarily very different. So I think it's it's something about thinking kind of holistically about the thing that you're communicating and how the different elements support it and not just, oh, we can't have that image or that image or that image um, or word. Um, and then I think the other thing we're doing, we've just started a, a, pro a process working with the University of Glasgow to develop language guidelines in the first instance. Um, so this has been done in many other sectors. Uh, disability around other other forms of addiction uh, based on, on how do you what language should you use that's not stigmatizing and, and not harmful and I've, in some sectors that's proceeded also to imagery so coming from suicide or harm they also have guidelines around so I think a process of developing those both with people with lived experience but then also considering how those are received by the wider public so for example the word addiction some people feel very much that's a word that they do want to use or gambling disorder but also how is that then received in the wider public and what does that mean in terms of how the issue is understood and whether it's stigmatized or not stigmatized so I think developing guidelines so starting the process of the University of Glasgow but developing those guidelines in a very consultative way both with lived experience but also with other groups of people who are going to come into contact with that language to see how and images to see how that works. 
helpful. I think following on from that, it's about understanding the unconscious bias. Um, so my background is mental health, huge stigma around mental health. Um, and even now, we've, we've, we've still got a long way to go. Um, but yes, if if we can understand, because you're right, when, for some people, you use one word and it means one thing. You use another word and it means something else. And I just have to put it in there and I apologise if I'm being cynical. I have noticed the gambling industry have now picked up and are using the term gambling harms. And I thought, well, and that's progress. Um, you know, as opposed to harmful products, which is really where we want to get to. Can I just say one, one more thing that um, follows on from what Claire was saying? It was something that um, struck me from the, um, the first panel was that um, something we've struggled with when it comes to children and young people is that often the kinds of stories or the kinds of messages that will work um, or maybe would connect and, and people could identify with as adults are quite different um, than those that'll connect with children and young people, particularly when it comes to the impacts of experiencing gambling disorder. Um, it, it looks different for children and young people. So in terms of, um, for example, like the, the packaging um, comparison, it, it would need to be different depending on like say loot boxes, if you're picturing it being um, younger people consuming them, you, the kind of worst case scenario that a young person is gonna recognize and think that could happen to me is going to look quite different to the worst case scenario for an adult. So if it's something like, um, relationship breakdown or losing your your job or going bankrupt those are things that um, we've we've heard from young people just feel it doesn't apply to them that's not something that that is on their kind of radar um, whereas something around impact on their education or their pocket money or the relationships they've got with um, like friends or a significant other those are things that are a bit closer to home that they might be able to kind of recognize and see and, and see themselves in that a bit more. So I think, I, I suppose it's, it's straight a bit from the imagery <laughs> question, but it relates to kind of the stories and who's gonna be, who's gonna be the one that you're actually aiming at. I was gonna ask if the audience had any questions, so it's perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> Push and hold it. Oh, is it a different one? One, two, one, two. Yeah, hi. Yeah, just on that, was just to say that um, you're right what you were saying in terms of it's different for child in terms of an adult and a child and that kind of delivery and the imagery and, and certain things you might say. But also, I had an example of this where we delivered to a sixth form school um, and at the end, we said, we'll hang around and have a chat if anyone wants to have a chat, etc. And the sixth form student came up to me and said, oh, we're so pleased that you came in today. And I said, why is that? And he goes, because my, you know, my parents are split up. We've got divorced because of my dad's gambling. So some of the stuff they will relate to within the home. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I just want yeah, to... Yeah, absolutely. And as affected others, there's a, there's a whole host of things. Um, but in terms of, like, if we're thinking of on gambling products. Yeah. So we're thinking of kind of... Um, people who are potentially just about to use something, so we're not looking to kind of connect it to other people in their lives who might be experiencing something, but you, specifically right now, mm. you are at risk of X. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. I think the messaging needs to be it, yeah. I, I, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, <laughs> no, I don't know what it needs yeah. to be. But, but it's I, interesting I, when you, you mentioned different. earlier, because you, you seem reluctant to talk about you know, imagery, whether it's right, certain images being shown, you know, within schools, etc. And we, I just want to point this out to you, because we've delivered to 45 schools now, and, you know, every single school, we've not come back with anything about, oh, that's too sensitive, you shouldn't be talking, oh, that image about suicide, etc. But we've delivered it as real as we can, because we have to show it as real, because it's what's happening today. Uh, and they get that, to be fair. Hmm. Um, oh, so shut up now. So the, it's, it's a really... <laughs> 
it's been something we've struggled with, to be honest, um, because I think when when I first joined the project, it was something that we used more. I mean, so for example, if we were going to deliver something on gambling advertising, we might show a, a gambling ad to kind of dissect it and say, um, you know, look at this bit on the free bet. So notice this thing over here. But um, that was flagged by, well, and a, a range of other kind of imagery was flagged by lived experience partners that we work with because when it comes down to it, we're engaging with potentially quite young children and young people. Um, and there was concern, especially so poten potentially around things like activities that young people might be engaging in. You don't want to be introducing something to young people. Now, obviously, gamb gambling advertising is all over the place, so we're not going to be introducing anything that they haven't seen. But um, if we're getting people to, say, take part in a, a game that's designed to um, to show them how gambling mechanics work, we need to be so incredibly careful about the outcome of that and the conversations around that. So I suppose um, the same has been said for us around imagery. So it's been really important for us to make sure that we're not... Um, so say, you've, say you're working with somebody or somebody is looking at um, a new resource you've created and it shows um, a form of gambling that they haven't taken part in before. Because in, as an 11-year-old, say they haven't ever had access to an online casino. They've never used one. We'd, we'd want to be really sure that we're not showing them something new. That it was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize they had games like that. I really like that, the look of that game. So I, I suppose it's that kind of balance between being real with children and young people but also not putting them at further risk of harm. Um, and as I say, I'm not sure we've, we've got the balance right, but we always try and keep calibrating on the basis of feedback from both children and young people and people with lived experience. I think we have a question over there. Hello, hello, is that working? <laughs> hello. Yeah. Hi, um, it was more really on stigma, the question I wanted to ask because I'm pretty sure at the moment um, addiction isn't recognised legally as a sort of on the Disability Act in the way that other, other health conditions are. And although it's stated that it's a health problem, legally it's not treated as a health problem. Do you think that um, then has an impact on the way that stigma is allowed, you know, continues because it can make have an impact on the way that that people who then become addicted to gambling are treated but then also it then allows these gambling organizations to come in the way that they do surely um to bombard people online has got to be a sort of breach of their human rights or you know do you think it would if if that legislation was to change do you think that would make a difference? Definitely. I think one of the challenges people have as well is that if someone has a drug and alcohol problem and they get into trouble with the, the criminal justice system, they can call for all sorts of psychiatric and, court rep and uh, social work reports. That's something that somebody with a gambling addiction really has to fight really hard for. Um, so that that's taken into consideration. Um, because I, I think you're right, while, while it's seen as, well, that's the person can't control their behaviour, then it's not recognising, no, that's a harmful product. And in terms of the, the, f the free giveaways, what I would say is, well, what would happen if there was a tobacco company standing in Buchanan Street? You can tell by the voice I come to Glasgow. So, standing in Buchanan Street going, here, have a packet of fags. There you go. No, have two. You stop smoking. You really sure you want to stop smoking? Love the new brand we've got here. Oh, and if you have a real problem with it, don't worry. We've got a cancer ward that we've sponsored. And I think that's a challenge as well. It's a challenge for charities funded by the gambling industry. Um, because they want to make a difference, but they're funded by an industry 
as opposed to the government step in and actually have a harms tax on the industry, which then goes to the charities that are doing amazing work. But instead of it coming straight from the gambling industry, it actually comes through another route. And when all these things happen, I think then things begin to change. But we are getting there. I won't go into the story. 2007, we listened to local people telling us that next to drugs and alcohol, gambling was a problem for themselves and for their family. And it's taken us from then to now to find others that we can work with to make a difference. So the fact that Fast World would have arranged this conference and thanks for inviting me along is a huge step in the right direction. But yeah, we've a while to go. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. So I think when we're thinking about stigma and discrimination, stigma, we also need to think about discrimination. Uh, so and those two things interact and reinforce each other. So. I think you have a situation at the moment where people who develop difficulties with gambling are kind of subject to sort of societal gaslighting from every direction. So you've got a government that doesn't, it kind of says, oh, we're starting to recognise it as a public health issue, but it doesn't very clearly say, look, this is a harmful and addictive product. Um, that is, it's, it's, that's, you have the gambling industry who has spent a huge amount of time making it a very much an issue of individual responsibility, lack of control. You have a lack of public understanding of really what this, this is. So from every direction, people get the message that if you can't manage this, it's your own fault. It's a harmless activity. It's fun. It's everyone should be doing it. It's all around us. And you know, it, it, gambling does enjoy this bizarre position in re compared to alcohol or tobacco, where it is still very much, oh, this is just something we should all be doing and it's really fun. and. You know, it's up to you. You should be able to control yourself. Um, and all of those things do create huge stigma, but that stigma then also then justifies discrimination in various ways. And, and you know, it justifies that in regulation. So we've got a gambling industry that's subject to kind of less controls and regulation than you would have if you went into like buy a cup of coffee. You're, there's more controls and safety around that than there is about gambling on this whole harmful product. And then, as mentioned, it flows through all areas of public policy, criminal justice, lack of provision in health and social care, everywhere. Um, so absolutely, it's, it's, yeah, those two things interact. And to address one, you have to address the other, right? You can't just go, oh, we need to all change our views about gambling addiction. But actually, the wider context isn't reinforcing or changing this method either. That's really great. Actually, that's perfect timing. I would like to thank you all so much for taking part and coming and talking to us about what you do. Thanks so much.